Welcome to The Real News. I'm Mark Steiner. Great to have you all with us. Now, when you look at the coverage of the killing of Soleimani, the situation in Iraq and Iran, pulling out of the nuclear treaty with Iran, and the subsequent sanctions against that country, you have to begin to ask yourself, who's been asking the tough questions? Now, we laud the murders of those the United States classifies as terrorists. And on the wake of Soleimani, we see that lies were told once again, that this has been in the works since 2017, not just over the last couple of weeks. We read stories in the New York Times and see on TV news programs stories of Iraq war veterans killed and maimed. They're now suing Iraq. I understand the pain they go through. But do we have amnesia here? Are the lies told us about Bush, Cheney, Tennant, Rumsfeld that got us into this war in the first place? Do you remember the United States worked with Soleimani to fight ISIS? Do you remember that? And now the choices of increased conflicts in the Middle and Near East have grown exponentially. Well, we're going to figure this out today. Well, at least part of it, with our guest, Corey Peterson-Smith, Middle East Research Fellow at the Institute for Policy Studies, whose most recent article appeared in the New Times called, We Need a Strong Anti-War Movement, yesterday. And Corey, welcome. Good to have you back with us. Thank you. It's always great to be here, Mark. So it's interesting, you started your article off with uh, reminding us of not what just happened on January the 3rd, but reminding, what ha reminding us what happened on January the 1st, 2019, when Jamal al-Badawi was assassinated. Yeah, exactly. You know, folks who've been paying attention to the drone war that the United States started after declaring the so-called war on terror under Bush and then wildly escalated under Obama know that that war has been shrouded in secrecy. It's been operated by the Department of Defense and the CIA, and they have not disclosed uh, who was on the list of people to be killed, how you get off the list, uh, when the killings happen, et cetera. So journalists and scholars and activists have been trying to figure this out for a long time. Last year, January 1st, opens with a U.S. drone strike in Yemen, and CENTCOM uh, and the Department of Defense tweets it out on Twitter a few days later, and so here we do have some information where the U.S. is publicly assassinating somebody by drone. And yet, where were the questions about that assassination and whether or not it was justified about the legality of the U.S. carrying out an extrajudicial assassination uh, elsewhere in the world? You presumably, we want these things to be public. I mean, they shouldn't be happening at all, but they should be public and transparent so that these institutions can be held accountable. And yet, the institutions that are supposed to have that accountability, like Congress, uh, the mainstream media, really have failed to ask questions with that assassination. And there's any number of things that happened over the past year uh, that Congress in particular uh, did not ask questions about when the U.S. Uh, did all kinds of things, not only in terms of threatening Iran, but in terms of escalating the war on terror in Somalia, uh, continuing operations in Yemen, uh, and, of course, in Iraq and elsewhere in the region, in, in Syria and so on. And so this is really the most recent stage that gets us up to this point. I mean, the, last week we had a situation where the U.S. really was on the brink of war with Iran um, in, in Iraq. And it was good to see members of Congress uh, asking questions about the justification of, of the assassination of Soleimani, um, it was good talking about the fact that Congress is the, the entity that uh, has a say in terms of the declaration of war and so on. But there were all these other actions that really paved the way to get us to, to that point. We have to look at all of those. So let's look at a couple of things here. Let's start with this. This is an interesting montage of, of uh, the U.S. media uh, in the wake of Soleimani's assass assassination. I think with these Democrats, uh, largely you're seeing these are lawmakers in uh, more conservative districts. You can't have this debate in this kind of supercharged partisan atmosphere. Nancy Pelosi does it again and her Democrats fall right in line. By the way, I don't care about Iranian cultural sites. This is the resistance continuing across overseas as adamantly as we've seen it here at home. So if you take that and also if you look at the um, article that was in the New York Times today about the kind of fluctuating expectations of the, for the Soleimani strike, I mean, explanations, I should say, that the Trump administration gave. I mean, so there were a lot of lies leading up to this. So the question is, let me talk to you a bit about your thoughts that I know you have and you've been writing about, about what has not been asked and what, what should have been asked. 
Right. Well, I mean, we can go back. Of course, there's a whole a whole long history um, uh, and questions that haven't been asked. But even just going back to December, I mean, the, the month opens with the Washington Post uh, publishing what they call the Afghanistan Papers, a whole trove of documents and uh, articles that, that constitute an investigation about how the U.S. lied over years, over these 18 years that the U.S. has been uh, waging war in Afghanistan, um, and uh, that U.S. officials, even from their strategic standpoint, don't have a way of, of winning the war, if you can call it that. And yet they have continued to maintain these operations, to continue funding the operations, and so on. Uh, and so that was an opportunity for Congress to say, wow, we should have some congressional hearings into the fact that officials have been lying about U.S. operations in this, uh, this country under so-called uh, war on terror. Shortly after that, the New York Times published a, a set of documents, uh, including interviews with Navy SEALs, that really confirm what we already knew, that uh, Navy SEAL Eddie Gallagher, uh, who was charged with committing war crimes in Iraq, was in fact guilty of those crimes. Uh, and again, this is another area where the U.S. has been doing military operations for years and years. We have evidence of U.S. committing war crimes uh, in, in, in that country as well. And yet, where were the congressional hearings? In fact, the opposite thing happened. Congress passed a, a, a new military budget, $733 billion, really giving Trump the green light to continue the operations that he has been carrying out. Uh, and by the way, there were provisions such as that put forward by Ro Khanna that, that um, say that the president does not have the authority to declare war on Iran that were stripped actually from that final bill. Uh, and that was voted on with uh, the support of 188 Democrats in the House. And so there's any number of, uh, even before we get to the assassination of Soleimani, you know, Congress has essentially given Trump a green light uh, repeatedly in terms of military uh, activity. So, this, I mean, what you're referring to here is, is the National Defense Authorization Act that took place on December the 10th. Yeah, the vote was 377 to 48. Um, and and if, you, if you juxtapose that with this graphic here uh, of the weapons contractors and the, and, the, and the profit they're making, how their shares soared, I should say, uh, after the killing of Soleimani, um, and there's a direct connection between that act, weapons contractors, the U.S. Congress, and why people vote the way they do without asking questions. I mean, that to me is at the heart of this. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, essentially, it's just the, the, the U.S. military machine, it, it's like a runaway train. And it's there's nobody providing any kind of oversight for, for what uh, the U.S. is doing in these wars. Uh, and, it, and it's really kind of incredible. I mean, it, it, again, you know, I've, I've referred to a couple of things. When we're talking about U.S. operations in Afghanistan, in Iraq as well. With Iran, also, we have uh, Congress has repeatedly voted to put sanctions uh, on, on Iran, too. So um, in any number of ways, Trump has been given the green light to, to go ahead and, and basically do anything. <laughs> I mean, the, the U.S. military is able to do anything. We have evidence from Afghanistan to Somalia that the war on terror has only brought destruction and catastrophe. And yet, year after year, we see support for that uh, kind of war. Um, similarly, last week, so, so that, that's, I think, in terms of government officials, particularly in Congress, who really it's their role to be providing some oversight and I really think have failed to. Similarly, when we're talking about the mainstream media, it is good uh, that we are seeing some questions after the fact, after the assassination, after we were on the precipice of a new round of war with Iran. but. During that week, when we were on the brink, these questions were not being asked in the mainstream media uh, nearly enough. Uh, and so these institutions that are supposed to be checks on the power of the U.S. military are really failing. And I think that points to the importance of an anti-war movement to, to hold the government accountable. Let's talk a bit about that. I mean, because we, we, we don't know how this could unfold. It could unfold in some major uh, con confrontations inside of Iraq and Iran. We see massive movements in both of those countries uh, against their own governments, uh, right. also against American intervention. They're not for the Americans or they're for their own nation trying to be a, a place where they can live in a civil society. Uh, right. You see that taking place. And you see articles like in the New York Times today uh, of, of, about uh, American soldiers who were 
um, who were maimed and, kill, maimed and or killed in Iraq now suing Iran. Um, and so, again, you know, it's like, when you talk about the anti-war movement, it's almost like the left is stuck in some ways between a rock and a hard place. I mean, you know, when you look at those articles, my first thought, why aren't we blaming George Bush and Dick Cheney for lying us into this war that killed these Americans and maimed these Americans, not to mention the hundreds of thousands of Iraqis and dismembering an entire nation. But there's, a, there's an emotionality to it all, you know, and um, Americans who, who are killed and maimed are seen as fighting for their country. The same thing happened in Vietnam. Uh, you can go all the way back to the Spanish-American War with the anti-war movement. So let's talk right. about, about the difficulty here of, of building that opposition. You only have 48 people in Congress voting against the Nationalization, the, the Defense Act. So let's, right. let's, let's so let, maybe take, extrapolate out this, this idea you have about building an anti-war movement with that difficulty people face uh, in, in, the, in the popular mind. Right, absolutely. I mean, what this really gets at, I think, is the commitment to U.S. empire, which is so strong. I mean, it is overwhelmingly bipartisan, uh, and it's, it really presents a challenge for, for those of us here who are critical of what the U.S. does abroad. And I think that the key is for us to have an orientation on you know, the struggles in the region and around the world that are fighting for self-discrimination. And that's really got to, to guide us. I mean, we, in other words, we need to build an anti-war movement, but the movement needs to be a solidarity movement with people who are fighting for their own futures. And so before the assassination of Soleimani, or really before the, um, the protests that took place at the uh, U.S. Embassy in Iraq, the news that captured headlines for months out of Iraq was people mobilized on the streets for months and months fighting for a different Iraq. Iraqis right. of various backgrounds uh, overcoming the sectarian divisions that have been imposed on them saying that we want a different country. We're against this, uh, the, this corrupt government. We're against the foreign influence uh, in, in, in this country, whether that's by the United States or by Iran. And it, it's, it's, it's important to note that because there was some coverage in this country, in the mainstream media, of the protests against Iran, um, against the Iranian uh, consulates in, in southern Iraq and so on. That's very significant because Iran does have great influence in Iraq. But the United States, I mean, the, the current Iraqi government, its origins lie in the 2003 U.S. invasion of Iraq. Uh, that government has been given billions of dollars by the United States, particularly uh, in the form of military aid, in terms of training, and in terms of the joint operations that the U.S. has been carrying out with that Iraqi state. Uh, and so this is a struggle in the streets that was confronting what the U.S. is backing in Iraq. And it is, I, I would say one of many inspiring struggles in the region, including in Lebanon, again, where there's been this mobilization for months where people are fighting, again, against a corrupt uh, government and against sectarian division and fighting for a, a new kind of future. Uh, and we've seen popular protests in Iran as well. And so here you have people who are fighting um, from Lebanon to Iraq, to Iran, to Egypt, to Syria, you know, people who are, are mobilizing uh, and, and and in many ways challenging the U.S. presence and the U.S. wars in that region. And the question is, what are we doing in this country to build a solidarity movement that, that stands with those people? And that, that's really uh, important. I think that's very critical. I think that, that sounds like a subject we should have a little roundtable about with you and some others about how you do that. You know, I'm in, in Vietnam, one of the things that turned things around the Vietnam War, part of it, not all of it, was the Vietnam okay. Veterans Against the War. And you have people like Danny Sajerson and, and Matthew Ho and other Iraqi Afghan vets who are key to uh, make, uh, showing America that there's a different way and what happened to them and why they changed their thinking. You know, I think that's, that's that, so a movement does have to be built so it can be stopped because I feel like they're, they're, we're being railroaded into another war. We could, could be being railroaded into another war. Yeah, I, I think that that's, I think you're totally right. And, you know, there have been courageous veterans who have spoken up uh, against the U.S. operations. You have political prisoners like Chelsea Manning, uh, who, right. who has spoken up, right? And so those voices are really critical. I also think, you know, one thing, um, one difference between the U.S.'s wars today and those that took place in Southeast Asia in the 1960s and 70s is there is a much larger population of folks in diaspora whose, whose nations of origin are places where the U.S. is waging war, right? Who are living here in the United States and who have been speaking out against their oppression 
against their communities, against Somali communities, uh, you know, against uh, the uh, Iraqis who have been uh, attacked by ICE and so on in Michigan and elsewhere. Uh, last week, one of the issues was not only, it wasn't just that the U.S. was gunning for war with Iran, it's that people of Iranian background were detained at the U.S. border trying to re-enter the United States as well, right? Right, right. That right. also speaks to the Muslim ban. And so there, there, there's a large population of folks who are intimately connected with people in Iran and Iraq and Somalia and Yemen and those, who, who live here, who live in North America. And I think that they have a, a really important role to play uh, in terms of the solidarity movement. So I think that as activists, we have to ask, ask ourselves, how are we building a movement that you know, involves that kind of solidarity? And that requires not only looking at what the US is doing abroad, but it also involves taking on the incredible Islamophobia and repression that has characterized domestic life in the United States here for people of that population. Well, I wish we had a great deal more time with Corey, but we're talking with Corey Peterson Smith, who is a Middle East Research Fellow at the Institute for Policy Studies in Washington, D.C., joining us today from Boston. Corey, thanks for your work. Uh, look forward to continuing this discussion with you in the coming weeks and months and seeing if that movement is, can't be built on a massive scale. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Mark. It's always a pleasure. Mine too. And I'm Mark Stanley here for the Real News Network. Please let us know what you think. Take care. Thanks a lot for watching. Appreciate it. Uh, but do us one more solemn favor. Hit the subscribe button below. You know you want to. Stay up on our videos.